We're now going to turn our attention to the state pattern. As always, we'll begin our discussion of the state pattern by motivating its use in the context of the expression tree processing app case study. You'll see that state is one of the most complicated patterns in the Gang of Four book. It's actually not more complicated than visitor in terms of its structure and behavior, but what makes state complicated is the way it's applied to implement state machines. And those, of course, can be arbitrarily complicated. So in the next set of videos, I'll break down what state does and give you a much better idea of how to apply it and when it can be useful to solve real world problems. So we're gonna use state in the context of the expression tree processing app in order to be able to ensure that user requests on an expression tree are performed in the correct order. If you recall our discussion of the command pattern, we noted how in the context of things like verbose mode, you can have different user requests like sending in a format command or an expert command, a print command, an eval command, and so on. And what we're gonna use state for is making sure that those commands are given by the users in the right order, following the appropriate protocol in order to carry out the actions correctly. What we're gonna to do to make this happen is we're gonna use the state pattern to structure valid user request sequencing into the class hierarchy design itself. So it becomes embodied in the inheritance hierarchy and the various states represented by subclasses in the design. But first, let's take a step back and see why we need this pattern in the first place. So users are required to follow the correct protocol when they make requests on the expression tree that they're working on. Uh, for example, if you're in verbose mode, you can see here how you could go ahead and start out by doing a format command, and then you might go ahead and try to put a print command right after that. But were you to do that, even though you could type those commands in in that order, nothing stops you from doing that, it's actually incorrect because you're not allowed to call print until after you call expert to give it an expression to print or to evaluate. So there's actually a protocol embodied in these commands. Format has to be called first, then expert needs to be called before either print or eval. Once expert's called, then print or eval can be called in any order. And then you can also turn around if you want to and reformat with a different format or give another expert or quit and so on. So it's a very important to be able to have that sequence encoded into the processing of user requests. Otherwise, you're going to have very strange and unexpected behavior that's not flagged properly by the program. Well, how would you go about solving this problem? One way to do it would be to have a large if else conditional statement sequence or a switch statement where you've got a bunch of cases and handle the different states and the different sequences that way. The problem, however, is that using long if else chains or switch statements becomes tedious and error prone to write and maintain. In particular, the logic of the state machine quickly becomes tightly coupled with the functionality of the code. So it's like a big bowl of spaghetti. It's hard to figure out where things go. Writing this kind of spaghetti code, and even more importantly, trying to debug and maintain this type of spaghetti code is very complicated and unduly tedious and error prone for, for mere mortals to try to apply in practice for anything other than the simplest state machine. So what do we do instead? We're going to define an object whose behavior will vary depending on the state that the object is in. And that way we can have valid sequences of user requests that are represented via a state machine. So for example, thinking about our particular example here, we would start out in the uninitialized state for our state machine. And then when a user types the format command, that will then transition us to the order uninitialized state. Or maybe a better way to put this is the star order, because this could be pre-order, level order, in order, post order, and so on. And that's what you do when you make the format command. You, you go ahead and tell what order you want the input to be coming in. The user input expression will be in post order or in order and so on. At that point, then you can go ahead and give it an expression like minus five times three plus four. And that will then transition you to a new state, which is the order initialized state, where it would be pre-order, post order, level order, and so on, initialized state. Once you're in that particular state, then there's a whole bunch more things you can do. You can go ahead and print out the expression in order, post order, pre-order, level order. You can go ahead and evaluate it, say in post order. You can go ahead and give a new expression. You can change the format type. So you can see when each of the given states that you're in, certain operations can be applied successfully and correctly 
whereas other operations, if they're applied, will lead to errors being noted and exceptions being thrown. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to take that state machine I just walked through and we're going to use it to encode the classes in our object-oriented design. And in fact, just to make things easy here, I've color-coded the state machine states and I've also used the same colors in encoding the subclasses for the inheritance hierarchy you see below. So the, the root of this hierarchy is going to be the state abstract base class and then we have the uninitialized state derived class, which does a few things. And then from that, we have pre-order, uninitialized state, post-order, uninitialized state, in-order, uninitialized state, and level order, uninitialized state. And those are all the different star order, uninitialized state subclasses that inherit from uninitialized state. And then there are the corresponding star order initialized state classes. And you can see they inherit from the ones above. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, how the heck does this make anything any better? Trust me, when we get into the pattern in more detail, you'll see how this gets applied to reuse the structure and behavior of the componentry quite cleanly and make it easy to transition between different states in a relatively seamless way. These subclasses, what their, their purpose is, is to enforce the correct protocol for user requests by making the operations that they define work differently depending on what state the overall object is in. So this is what it actually looks like from the point of view of how you program it. Uh, there's something called a tree context, and this is the context that's used to ensure that user requests are performed in accordance with the appropriate protocol. And as you can see here, we have four main operations, four main methods in the context tree context class. We have format, expert, print, and evaluate. And not surprisingly, those correspond to the commands that the user can give. So these are the ones that the user can type in. And what we're going to do here is make sure that by using the state pattern, we can ensure that the commands have to be given in the right order. And if they're not given in the right order, that some kind of exception is thrown to inform the user that they violated the ordering protocol. There's another pair of setter getter methods to get the current state and to set the current state. We'll see how those get used in just a moment. And then finally, there's a pair of setter getter methods that are used to get the expression tree that's corresponding to the tree context and also to be able to set the expression tree that corresponds to the tree context. So that's how we actually get the content to work upon by the commands that the user is typing to us. And so this is just kind of serves, serves as a, an adapter or a shim between the expression tree where the actual data structure resides and that composite hierarchy managed through the bridge patterns abstraction class and then the actual user commands that are coming in from a graphical user interface or the command line or whatnot via the tree context class, which is itself being called by the appropriate commands that are part of the user command hierarchy that we talked about in the command pattern video. So from a commonality and variability point of view, we have a common set of methods, format, expert, print, and evaluate, which can be used to perform the operations on the tree. And from a variability point of view, the behavior of those different methods will differ or vary depending on the current state of the tree context. Now, there's also another corresponding class and class hierarchy here called the state class hierarchy. And this is basically the hierarchy that defines subclasses that will determine how users' requests are processed you can see that it has more or less the same method names as the tree context did. So you can see format, expert, print, and evaluate, which is what we had up here for the tree context. The big difference here is that these methods in the state hierarchy all take the tree context reference as the first parameter, followed by the string, which is the same thing we had for the tree context. And the reason for doing this is to use something called delegation, which is basically a, a pattern in its own right, really. And uh, this is described in a, a classic article by Ralph Johnson, one of the Gang of Four authors, and his grad student, Johnny Zvig, from the early 1990s. Actually, it predates the Gang of Four book. And they talk about the use of delegation. And this particular article, which you can read at the bottom of this link, uh, the, the link at the bottom of this page, is very, very interesting because it kind of talks about the state pattern before the state pattern had been documented. They, they basically use the state pattern to implement the TCP protocol. Uh, but be that as it may, 
what you see here is that when you invoke operations, when the tree context invokes operations on the state object, it passes a reference to itself to those methods, thereby delegating the operations to the state class methods while providing the context for various purposes, such as being able to change the state, among other things. So once again, we have commonality and variability. We have a common set of methods to perform user requests, and each subclass of state can implement these methods in different ways, depending, of course, on the current state that the object is in. And we're basically going to use this in order to keep track of the history of user command requests and thereby know whether the next command is valid based on what came before it. That's all about the whole concept of sequencing. So here's what it looks like, just another view of the hierarchy. You can see here that we've got the context, which then is used to reference the state. And then we have a bunch of subclasses of the state abstract base class that refine the behaviors depending on what state the object happens to be in based on the state machine that we're embodying with our class design structure here. This inheritance hierarchy is very useful because it embodies the state machine logic into the structure of the program. So once you understand the state machine logic and once you look at the structure, it should be pretty straightforward to reason about what's going on here because it's been made very explicit rather than having it be part of this spaghetti laden code that we talked about earlier with switch statements and if else condition uh, chains and so on and so forth. So again, just to wrap up this whole point, commonality and variability galore. Lots of things in common, but as always we can use capabilities like inheritance and dynamic binding to selectively override certain methods so they behave correctly or they throw errors correctly depending on the state that the object's in at a given point in time.